They identical. They only vary in the last three or four digits of a 16-digit precision. So we're being very precise about defining the bit of the object we're going to look at. Now you might think it'll draw a simple picture like this. You'll see a guy wearing one of these t-shirts, a Knights of Malta t-shirt, uh, in the room today. There he is. Come on, give him a round of applause. Thank you. Knights of Malta do a very good job uh, all over 160 countries of the world doing charitable work. So uh, it's a great pleasure to me when I found, when I was exploring the, the Mandelbrot set, which this little equation codes for, just watch the screen. Because this is the picture you might think a simple equation might draw. Here is the picture it does draw. Now, isn't that pretty? Now, I didn't do that with my crayons and my colouring set. No, I wrote the speech with those. Uh, this is generated by a computer. It's generated by that equation. And even though the values of the various pixels that we started with are almost identical to one another, you still get these fundamental changes in colour and these bandings that appear. And these are known as phase transitions or bifurcations. Sudden changes from what appears to be a steady state, a nice smooth bit of colour, and suddenly, kerblam, you hit a fence. And even if you make a very tiny alteration to the state of a mathematical object that exhibits chaotic characteristics, you can get very big changes happening very suddenly. And these changes are known to the climate left as tipping points. You hear them say, oh, they're going to be tipping points if we let the planet warm up. Why do they all talk like babies? I don't know. Anyway, they say they're going to be, yeah, yeah. Uh, hello. <laughs> My name's Julia, and I'm here to talk to you about tipping points. That's a question. Uh, really, it's, it's ridiculous. Because the truth is that in any chaotic object, particularly one which is influenced far more greatly by natural factors than by anything we can do, even a small natural change will cause a sudden variation in the behaviour of the object, like the Brisbane floods. Remember the Brisbane floods a few months ago? Somebody forgot to turn the right wheel on a dam upstream and uh, Brisbane kind of got a bit flooded, didn't it? And here's a picture of it. Now, yeah, the Greeks, exactly. And here's what happens when you get a sudden bifurcation in the evolution of the chaotic climate. You get an extreme weather event. But as we've seen, you don't get any more extreme weather events if you have a big change in, let us say, temperature. Even little fluctuations here and there, even tiny perturbations in the, in the initial value of some parameter that defines the climate object. There are millions of parameters there, not like that simple equation we looked at can cause these major changes. But I bet you that when this Brisbane flood happened, you heard people say, well, of course, we can't attribute an individual climate event uh, to global warming. Uh, but nevertheless, this is the sort of thing that we might be led to expect if global warming were to be <laughs> You've heard them say that. Uh, you've heard Julia Gillard say, well, I think we're going to get more global warming. We're going to see more of this kind of thing. Well, <coughs> uh, uh, I do apologise for my, for my stage Australian accent. Uh, of course, I come from Wales myself, but uh, no, anyway, this, this, is, this is the problem. Uh, this is the kind of wittering nonsense that they say. But of course, when we look at this picture, we are actually looking at um, 1893. That was the Brisbane flood of 1893. I went back through the fires and got a picture for you. <laughs> Don't you think? It's very interesting. And so that led to the question, how often have these major floods, as defined by your Bureau of Meteorology, how often have they occurred? And so I thought I would have a look and get the data. This is how we climate skeptics do things. We get the data. We don't just wave our arms and say, oh, it's going to be terrible, or oh, it's not going to be terrible. We get the data and we find out whether it's going to be getting terrible or not. Here we go. And between 1840 and 1900, there were eight major floods of the Brisbane River. Between 1900 and 2011, a period nearly three times as long, there were only three major floods. Ooh, uh. <laughs> so once again, you can see that there's no basis for assuming that just because we get more warmer weather, which we will if we add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, therefore this is going to lead to more disasters or tipping points or extreme weather events. The only extreme weather events that's likely to become more frequent are warmer weather events. 
heat waves. You will get more of those as the climate warms. But that, frankly, is about it, as we'll see. So to conclude on the business of whether computers can model the climate for 100 years ahead, here is my summary of the position, the long-term prediction of future climate states by using computer models is not possible. And I know that must be true because that was actually said by the Intergovernmental <coughs> Panel on Climate Change in 2001. <laughs> so how then should we do science if we don't do it by consensus and we don't do it by letting loose the zitty teenagers with their Xbox 360s and Playstations to do modeling? What do we do? Well, we use a technique known as the scientific method. And you won't hear very much about this in the climate debate because the other side don't use it. But we do, and here is how it works. It was first propounded by this gentleman you see on an Iraqi banknote. He was Abu Ali ibn al-Hassan ibn al-Hussein ibn al-Hussein ibn al-Haytham. Al and he was even prouder, as you can tell by that string of patronymics, of his ancestry than I am of mine. He was an aristocrat, of course, all the best scientists are. <laughs> he was a mathematician, a philosopher of science, an astronomer, and a thinker. Very like me in so many respects. And, and what he said is this, that the seeker after truth, that was his beautiful phrase for a scientist, the seeker after truth, does not put his faith in any mere consensus, however broad, however venerable. Instead, he subjects what he has learnt of it to his own hard-won scientific knowledge and to scrutiny, inspection, investigation, checking, checking, and checking again. The road to the truth, said al Haitha, is long and hard, but that is the road we must follow. There aren't any easy answers in proper, true science. And you certainly can't just say, oh, 97% of all scientists say we've got a problem, say we've got a problem. No, we have got a problem if 97% of all scientists are saying the same thing when most of them aren't qualified to say anything about it because they've never looked. <laughs> That's not a useful scientific arrangement. Consensus has no place in the scientific method. And it was put, uh, still more bluntly, by... T.E. Huxley, in his famous debate over evolution with Bishop Sobe Sam Wilberforce uh, at the Oxford Museum of Natural History in 1860. And he said, the improver of natural knowledge absolutely refuses to acknowledge authority as such. For him, scepticism is the very highest of duties. Blind faith, the one unpardonable sin. Skepticism. Karl Popper, who formalized the uh, scientific method for our time in a celebrated paper of 1934, a great philosopher, he said that, um, that the scientific method is an iterative algorithm. Well, now that may sound a bit complicated. What it means is it's a series of stages, each leading to the next, which goes round and round and round until a conclusion is reached. And we start in science with a general problem. And that general problem might be, well, the planet is getting a little bit warmer. Whose fault is it? We'd like to know. And then a scientist comes along and makes a tentative theory, TT, on the slide there, to explain the answer to the problem. And then, when he's put forward his tentative theory in proper mathematical terms in a scientific journal, then along comes all the other scientists and a few tiresome, commodity people like me up around the edge, and they say, right, we're going to tear your tentative theory apart. And if the theory at that point is disproven, it's NP, not proved, it's disproved, then it fails at that point, and that's where the process comes to an end. Or it may, in very, very rare cases, be proven. That's P on the other side there, in which case the algorithm also comes to an end and we have an answer to the general problem. And that's no more a problem. We've advanced science in a very definitive way, either by proof or disproof. But what nearly always happens in almost every scientific question is that it doesn't behave like Pythagoras' theorem. There is no easy proof or even a difficult proof or disproof for that matter. You merely find that the uh, hypothesis that's put forward is not 
disproved, it not proved, but nobody